how to get a method up and running in a CLIA lab. So say for instance, you have a chemistry instrument, you wanna get some methods validated, we're gonna go over step by step how you would accomplish something like that. So this is gonna be a dense video, but a very useful video. The reason why I'm doing this video is I run a CAP approved uh, lab. It was a pain to have our entire team get CAP approved. It was super rigorous. It was very difficult to find information. The thought process is, is hey, if I'm able to share this information, this is gonna make your life a lot easier, and hopefully this will help you in getting your lab up to the standard you're trying to get it to. So the type of tests we're gonna be focusing on is the LDT. LDT stands for a Laboratory Developed Test. What this is is, uh, you as a CLIA high complexity laboratory, you're able to validate your own tests. Now the validation is extremely rigorous, so you're gonna see there's a lot that needs to happen in order to get one of these LDTs up and running. Before you begin, you wanna decide your test method. What are you trying to bring up? What are you trying to do? So say for example, you had a mass spec and you wanted to do toxicology on there, you're gonna have to decide the method for that. The next thing you're gonna wanna do is figure out billing. If you're, if you're doing insurance, what are the CPT codes and what's the reimbursement on that? What are the requisites that you need to have to be able to submit for reimbursement depending on the state that you're in? Do you need doctor's orders? The next thing is you're gonna to need to have a proficiency testing template. So you're gonna to have to be making sure that your assay is robust and it works every time. So that's gonna be part of your proficiency testing. Since it's an LDT, that means there's not an FDA clearance for that. But if it was like a non-CLIA wave FDA approved test, then, then you would have the clearance for that. So LDTs is specifically for non-FDA approved tests. I'm assuming you're not gonna do this all by hand. Some labs still do that, but these days most people use a LIMS, which is a laboratory information management system. You're gonna to have to devise a plan in order for this assay to be reported out and tracked and accession through your limb system. So now let's get into the validation. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to take that plan that we just talked about and all that documentation and what you're gonna do and then you wanna present that to your lab director. So your lab director is the person who signs off on all the tests, usually an MD. Um, this person um, is gonna to have to look at your validation plan and decide if you're missing any things, but once uh, everything looks good, you're gonna get the go ahead from your lab director and then you can begin your validation. Immediately after you um, get the validation plan approved, uh, you have to now make sure you have everything that you need to start your validations. That includes making sure that the system or the instrument that you have is set up and installed properly and there's something called an IQOQ that you need to have. So if I'm setting up a mass spec, I need to make sure it's on the bench, it's in the spot where we're gonna keep it, and then you do an IQOQ, which stands for installation qualification, operation qualification, usually the person selling you the instrument is gonna be able to offer this service as well. It's necessary. You're gonna also have to order all the supplies that you need. There might be calibrators, they might be standards, patient samples, you're gonna need to make sure you have all of that. You need to make sure you add this instrument to your master instrument list so you have everything uh, available for tracking. The next thing you're gonna wanna do is to establish your quality management system. That includes result QC tracking, the tracking and labeling of samples, QC monitoring, and then finally that includes setting up your turnaround times. The other things that you would want to have in your binder are you wanna collect any IFUs, which stands for instruction for use. So basically the step-by-step -step instructions for running your actual method. And then you also wanna have any application notes in there as well. That should prepare you pretty well to, to start your validation. So now let's focus on making sure we're getting the calibration set up. So in order to do the calibration, you need to make sure you have standards, setting up your reference ranges, you know, that's building your cal curves, and also you wanna make sure you have the QC samples or the controls ready. You also wanna make sure you have patient samples ready so you can check to see if your patient samples that you're testing are accurate. And one other thing you wanna really focus on is the sample container requirements. That's also sometimes something people overlook. You know, if it's a patient sample, there's gonna to need to be transport. You need to make sure that you know what kind of sample containers you need and what are the methodologies for making sure that the stability of the sample is appropriate in that sample packaging. So now let's get into the meat of it. This is the validation. This is the big part of the, uh, the process. This is the, also the most painful part of the process. For an LDT, about seven things you really wanna focus on. So those seven things are analytical accuracy. What that is is, hey, are the values 
where they need to be. And then you want to focus on analytical precision. What analytical precision is, is like, hey, if I'm throwing all these samples over and over again on the system, am I getting the same value back, right? It doesn't help you if you're getting values that are jumping all over the place. You also want to make sure that you're getting your reportable range. So what's relevant, what's in range, what's dangerous, what's out of range, what's a critical value. Those are all really important to set up. You also want to have your analytical sensitivity set. What that is, is like how low can you go? Is zero really zero? Or is your instrument not sensitive enough, right? Because sometimes a very, very low amount of a substance has a clinical relevance. So you also need to establish the sensitivity of that assay. You also want to do the patient correlation. So what that's saying is like you team up with another lab, they send you samples, you run the samples, and you want to verify like, hey, that lab's approved and you know they're doing a good job. If they send me the same samples here and I have 20 samples from a patient, am I able to get the same values? So you need a, a, a lab to correlate with. And then you also want to focus on analytical specificity. What that means is like, hey, Am I targeting the compound I'm looking for? It's not getting misconstrued with another similar compound. You also want to look for specimen stability. Hey, if I have this sample and it's sitting in storage and I ran it today and I ran it five days ago, are my values going to change? Is that sample going to go bad over time? You also want to focus on reagent stability. Are the reagents that I'm using, are they, you know, are there expiration dates that I need to pay attention to? If not, how long do those reagents last in the fridge? We want to test frequently to make sure like, hey, chemicals that I'm using or these reagents that I'm using, they're not going bad over time because that would affect my results. You would want to focus on linearity. What linearity means is does the calibration curve hold? If you start to increase your concentration, the Cal curve becomes somewhat parabolic, so it's not directly linear. And what you also want to see is, are you getting good linearity? Meaning, as you're building your Cal curve, are you getting a very, very good R squared value? Or is your Cal curve kind of all over the place? The line is kind of a guess in the middle, but it's not very, very accurate. You also want to focus on carryover. What carryover is, is like, hey, if I did a sample, and then I ejected like a blank right after it, am I going to see that? sample show up on the next run, because if it did, you're getting artificially higher values from run to run. Is there cross-contamination, right? So if you're running a bunch of samples, are you getting hits where there should be blanks? So if you're running blanks throughout, uh, are, you, are you seeing stuff carry over or, or just contaminate as you're handling your samples and specimens? And lastly, interference. Is there junk within the assay that's covering up your analyte or causing your analyte to not report the accurate value because of other things in the sample matrix? Do you need to do a, maybe a better job in terms of sample prep and sample cleanup. So these are all the things that you have to focus on during an LDT, it's, it's quite extensive. That's why the FDA approved tests are gonna be less heavy lift to get up and running. After you gather up all of this information, uh, you want to present it in a way that your lab director can sign off on the results if all the results look good. What you would want to focus on after that is making sure that your instrument is paired up nicely with your LIN system so you can report out results. If you have a billing system that, you know, the billing gets sent out and then the patient has maybe a really nice and frictionless way to get their results if it's a doctor or maybe direct to patient. So your LIN system would take care of all of that. And so that kind of essentially covers all the things that you need to hit when setting up an LDT. So that's how you validate an LDT and that's going to be the most difficult assay to validate in a high complexity lab for FDA approved tests, whether they're clear waved or non-clear waved they're a lot easier to do. And we'll be going over those two in a different video. So everything that we talked about, if you want all of that in a nice, easy to read checklist, there's a link in the description. And that's how you validate an LDT for your laboratory. See you in the next one.